Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to Maisha Kazini, where we have conversations with people who are thinking and reflecting on the different issues that we face as a nation. So once again, due to public demand, we are pleased to welcome Mordecai Ogada, who is a conservation consultant and an expert in matters of environment and of life in general. Um, so welcome again, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Wandia. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. So um, when the year ended, we were so perplexed by the strike of the medical workers, the different um, messages that the different cadres of people were, were, give, were saying. And even now, I think you you are reminding me some time back that even now the lab, the lab technicians are also threatening to go on strike. So basically, our conversation today is to talk about, you know, why do we have these divisions and what do they say about work, about the work that we do. Um, so I maybe we can start off by um, you giving a brief assessment of. What what is the problem with all these divisions and different messages and the kind of uh, decisions, especially the doctors were making? Yeah, thanks. I I think I think a basic uh, problem that we face in Kenya is failing to distinguish between work and jobs and mm -hmm. service. We we sort of have this mishmash where we, all these things seem to seem to be used interchangeably yeah. and what work in the in the context we've been using in our conversations is a, something that you do that confers dignity confers a living as well in terms of material gain or for your livelihood but it also defines you in society yes and and it's it's something you look back on and and uh, make miles look at milestones and achievements so what go in reference to the doctor's strike they they went on to on strike on very valid grounds that mm -hmm. they don't have the requirements to do their work but then it, somewhere in the course of the strike the 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 divisions started becoming apparent and it's baffling that doctors were talking about their needs separate from those of clinical officers and separate from those of of nurses mm -hmm. yet I cannot imagine a single thing that a doctor needs that a nurse doesn't need as well as a human being, be they protective equipment, be they medical cover, mm -hmm. better remunerations, etc. But as a force, as a force, they would be a very formidable force to whoever is in office in government dealing with them. If all health workers presented a unified front. Yeah. And this is why the schisms have been between them have been exploited by those in office mm. and they've basically been been told that you know you're better than those other guys so come let's talk to you separately those other guys are have uh, unreasonable demands or or they, they are not the a students that you people are and that kind of thing and they've bought it because uh, i've i've ha i've had a chance to look at some of the agreements that they they put together and even to my complete layman's knowledge to so frightfully weak agreements and they have they basically have gone back to work just to show that they are special and different from the nurses but time will tell if 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 they're right or wrong in that decision okay but let me just uh, be the devil's advocate here do you think that that is how a doctor who is agreeing to go back to work is that how they are thinking i'm kosher I don't need, you know, what, what is the, what, what makes them reach the point where they are not thinking about why don't we connect with the nurses, the clinical officers, the, the lab technicians, the, even the cleaners. In fact, I would think the cleaners do the worst work. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they're probably victims. They're probably victims of our education system. Yeah. That, that inculcates stratification from the very mm. earliest point yeah and th this is i think something brought in from the british education system the system of prefects monitors making it acceptable and normalizing the fact that another child can actually 
exercise power over you yes. as, as, a, as a pupil. Mm. And, and there's nothing you can do about it. I went to Nairobi school where the power prefix was absolute. And you, there's nothing you could do about it. You just hope to become a senior or a prefect later on so that you can apply the same hammer on your juniors. And the, the, the cycle of violence continues. And it, it gets out into society as well. So everyone, the objective of being in an important position turns out to be just to exercise power or, or to look down upon mm. others rather than fulfill your, your service or duty to society. So I, I think that, that, is, that is very much the problem. That's why we are fragmenting uh, professions into different unions. So in fact, if I go back to the medical sector, you find that the objective of the medical sector, in my view, should be the health of the society. Medical practice is not an objective. The problem facing the medical sector is the fact that we lost sight that the objective of medical practice is to achieve health, a healthy society, health for the society. We've got stuck at the practice point where we think medical practice itself is an objective. If I compare it to, if I compare it to a mechanic fixing a car, his objective is to get a car moving smoothly down the road. What he uses to get there is a toolbox with spanners, pliers, and all these other things. So the toolbox is not his objective. Mm -hmm. The objective is the car on the road. But in medical practice, we got stuck at the, we've been stuck at the toolbox. We've forgotten that we need to keep an eye on the, the final objective, which includes, which includes nurses and includes clinical officers and lab technicians and all the other, all the other parts, uh, people who make a hospital function. So I think we need to revisit the objective. The objective should never be the, uh, the technical details of how we get to a place. A farmer's objective is not to drive a tractor. It's to till a field and produce food. That's we are stuck in driving tractors around the road <laughs> all over Asking the place. Asking to be paid for qualifications because yes. now I, I have a driving license for a tractor, yes. yet I'm not being paid for that license. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, now, yeah, now it's about I've got the license and I'm the one who sits on the, the, the driver's seat on the tractor. Mm. We've forgotten the, the rest of the chain. And I think I think that has been inculcated from very early in our medical system, in our educational our education system. system. Yeah, and mm. some of us think differently despite our educational system. Mm. I think I, it's, 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 uh, it's actually an, an anomaly that someone comes out of our education system not thinking like that. Mm. And, and before even we continue talking about work, what kind of political thinking is behind the refusal to provide, uh, first of all, medical equipment and then to pay medical workers? What? And then the same people who are refusing to do that are also now coming to tell us that their job is to give us universal health care and what. How is it that they're able to get away with this dissonance? And Kenyans are not pointing it out. I, it, it, it's, it's quite a puzzle. But I think mm -hmm. one of the things is being in a constant state of flux or crisis where everyone's just chasing to get what he can feed his children tonight. I think that that is a very powerful tool. I mean, if you want to control workers, of, of any sector, doctors or whoever in Kenya, don't give them terrible terms. It's, it's almost like negative reinforcement on, on slave plantations. They'd be whippings daily. Yeah. So by the end of the day, the one who gets only two lashes feels much better than the one who got 10 lashes. Yet they're all slaves being whipped. Mm. So in, yeah, in, in fact, even the, yeah. the workplaces are toxic for that reason. It's too Very abusive. Make sure that you never think about, uh, never pause to ask, wait a minute, why is this happening? So Kenyans yeah. are not connecting. The, yeah. the, I think in a sense, sometimes I feel that the word corruption has made us lazy. You know, we yeah. look at money being stolen and we think that that is the problem, but actually that's not, oh. that's a symptom of the problem. It's a symptom of violence. Of violence, the fact that the political class does not want healthy Kenyans, but of course they can't say that. 
So yeah. they tell us stories of, oh, I'll bring you dispensaries, I've put aside yeah. money and what, what, what. But when you ask, are our medical workers being paid? Do they have equipment to treat us? There's no story about that. Y yes, indeed, we've reached a point where violence from the, from especially from the state and state organs mm -hmm. has become so normal that you feel happy and it's an achievement if you drive from Nyanza to, back to Nanyuki and no point in the trip did I get stopped and harassed by a policeman over my tires or my cracked headlight. Mm -hmm. I feel, oh my God, it's been wonderful. Yet that's what, it, that should be normal. Yeah, it's like you, we go to workplaces and at the end of the day, we feel happy because I didn't get abused today. Wow, it's mm. been a great day. Mm. That should be normal. Mm. That should be normal. And, and, the, and even, even you compare yourself with others and say, oh, I'm so, I'm so much better than so-and-so. I had a quiet work day and he got abused. Mm. The abuse, abuse has become normalized such that escaping abuse becomes like an achievement. Mm. So even in the workplace, mistreatment has been normalized such that you get thrown a few crumbs, you think it's an achievement. Mm. Well, mean, meanwhile, yeah, you're, you're just the slave who got less, fewer lashes, but you're still a slave. You're still picking cotton. You're still on the plantation. And in fact, I think, you know, I wish our conversations would be less. You're not paying me for my qualifications, but... yeah. yeah. You're not, you're not facilitating my work. Yes. I get no dignity from seeing people die just like that when I can help them. Yes. And then also I can't live when I'm not being, when I have, when I take home nothing after yes. all that, after, after all, all that, that I do. But instead our conversation is qualifications and whether the salaries were paid. And by the way, even lecturers are like yes. that. And I, I, I think yes. I asked them once, you know, what are you people going to talk about the work that we do and how how these policies are preventing us from teaching the way we want, we should teach, the way we know we should teach. Instead, we're always saying we were supposed to be paid like judges. I remember hearing union officials saying at, when in the, at independence, we were paid the same salary as judges. Maybe the, yeah. the judges are paid too much. Who knows? <laughs> yes, who knows? And, and yes. why should you care about that? Yeah. Which brings me to, you know, the problem of elitism and work. Because the 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 I think the first conversation we had, you talked about expertise and mm -hmm. being uh, facilitated and rewarded and respected for one's expertise. Yes. Yeah. What's what's the difference between expertise and elitism? I think I think elite, elitism is is uh, is the, the status that is conferred or or you assume is conferred to you by by mm -hmm. your your qualifications, your the papers you have, the the prefix to your name, mm -hmm. or even the office in which you physically sit. Mm -hmm. Ex expertise is I, is what you've actually contributed to society in your given in your given, your chosen, uh, your chosen path. And I think this, and this can actually be anything. You could be an expert uh, livestock rearer, uh, livestock farmer. You could be an expert tailor, expert mechanic, architect or whatever. But we've, we've moved away from this to move it to prefixes. You hear people calling the, obviously there's doctor so-and-so, there's engineer so-and-so, Oh yeah, yes. architect. Ar Ar architect so and so. I've yeah. even seen quanti quantity surveyor so and so. US so and so. Yes, and yes. And, and, and I, I wonder how soon we will get even down to butcher so and so, mechanic so and so. And and so if if you are a good if you are a good doctor, that the good the good um, the, the good medical uh, practice and and uh, solutions you provide to health problems speak for themselves. They speak for themselves, and and that's the that's the thing. Even in the even in the con conservation field, you find people with high levels of of um, high qualifications. They're embracing that elitism, and sitting in offices with their PhDs in ecology, doing clerical work like signing work tickets and leave forms, 
mm. do, using none of their knowledge because and they're happy because he has the corner office very nice furniture in his office a very nice big suv out there that takes him back to the higher class areas of nairobi where he lives and but he doesn't use ecology in any of his work he's doing administrative work that any clerk any clerk could do but and that he feels happy because of elitism mm -hmm. he's actually not an expert in any, anything and and this gets ruthlessly exposed in instances like where um, there was an, a case where lions were being implanted with contraceptives in a certain conservancy here in Kenya, based on the feelings of someone who has no post-secondary qualifications. And you should have seen the PhDs, veterinary doctors, and highly technical qualified people running there to do the bidding of this secondary school dropout. That is, encapsulates the problem. And Again, we get back to what we said of how many medically qualified people are working outside the medical field, how many engineers are working in banks, and because the whole system doesn't want us to work. It wants, oh, yes. To, yes, it wants elitism, not work. Mm. It, it doesn't want work. And, and that's, that's where our challenge lies because a, a pastoralist who is producing livestock is a very powerful person. But the, the conservation sector wants a, a pastoralist who's serving drinks in the lodge. We don't want a pastoralist producing livestock. And that's, and we say we are paying him, we've given him a job. And we keep saying this creates jobs, jobs that don't provide mm. livelihoods, that don't provide mm. dignity. But this, see Kenyans, the way Kenyans are cynical, see they're going to say Atibora ni mepata abshara. See, that's yes. what they'll say. Yes, y yes, and many say, many do say that, and I think mm. that is that is the singular achievement, uh, greatest achievement that the system has made in 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 reducing us to sums of material, brick and mortar, or metal. The car he drives. Oh yes. That. That that certainly makes suddenly makes it okay. It doesn't matter what I'm doing for that. And then you know, when you grow older, and I think maybe that is why the two of us and other people, a few of us our age, yeah, are having yeah. this conversation because we've reached a point where we we can't just keep talking about salaries. We have yes. to have a feeling that. All this time I've worked, I've worked, I've had an yeah. impact. Somebody's I've life, I've contributed, somebody's life has changed. But then when you talked about that during our first conversation, people thought you were saying, I don't have mm. money issues. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, in, in, in fact, in fact uh, it, 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 was, it was shocking, it would have been amusing if it wasn't so, such a sad indictment that, yeah, people said, so this, guy's, this guy's made it, he's got, he's, got, uh, he's got absolute financial security and he's making a lot of money and they forgot that what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying is that it's a, it's a level of freedom and, and achievement and contribution to society. And like I said, even in the scientific field, your work rarely gets to mean much until you do not need to publish. Yeah. You've decided within yourself, I can give this manuscript and they write to me and say, say we want you to change this. And I tell them, no, I'm not going to change it. Forget about it. I don't want to publish mm. in, in your journal. I'll do it elsewhere. When you reach that level, then you, you can actually have freedom of thought of thought and critical thought and you can criticize people and change things for the better and you can also accept criticism so it makes you a better scientist or technician or whatever it is you are once you have that freedom to think and accept thoughts of other people rather than struggle to fit more and more papers into this box that is defined by somebody who has nothing to do with you and and it's so sad that our young people can't see that and and it's not their fault they're young yeah. so you you yeah. need that you need the wisdom of of, of lived experience to see yes. that you know once you start working it's not just about the money and once your yes. kids start uh, growing up and leaving the house you're left yeah. with your memories
Then now you yes. start asking, what have I done? And you can't see anything. You just see a boss who is rude to you, who is half your age. Yes, and I, I think it's a very sad, it's a very sad thing. One of the most satisfying things personally for, for me is that, and I've worked many places because I've been, I'm very easily discontented and disillusioned. So I've left many, many jobs mm. and, and entered many new ones. But any of these places, whenever I go back, there's no office that I'm scared to walk into or oh, that yeah. I would walk into and not to be greeted. Hey, hi, how are you? And all that. And and uh, I think that is that to me is is probably my most important uh, professional achievement that I can go back any place I've been, any place I've worked, and find people happy with the time I was there, or what I left there, or what I did while I was there. And I think I think the 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 materialism is so deeply ingrained by the constant show off, even public mm. officers. The moment a new officer gets appointed maybe as permanent secretary the first thing he does is dispose of the car the former ps was using it might be six months old first thing there's some obsession with the cars they yeah. change the car they change the furniture in the office they change the carpets and everything so because it's all about material i don't know how long it takes them to finally get to the point where they start wondering okay what should i be doing as the ps now mm. or as the or, or this or that it's all about the new 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 th this that the other mm. and i think i think that that shows the very we have a very basic um very basic weakness there are certain things that we live and pass even things pass through parliament and our various other legislative organs simply based on the material aspects i don't think i don't think i can remember any bill or, or proposed legislation that failed or passed based on its moral content. It's either mm. in a tuletea nini ama haitusaidi and all those are material considerations. Mm. So we are reduced to the level of um, um, we are reduced to physiological level the stomach. If something, if something anything, for example if one could do an experiment, any bill in parliament that would extend the term of that house would pass to the last man or woman. Ah, there would what be no happen? opposition. There was no, no opposition because simply that is about, that's about remuneration. If it gives me one more month, two more months, one more year of salary, I'm voting for it. I'm, I don't, what it does to the country is secondary. And, and that's the sad place where we reach and, and the young people admire leaders because of their material wealth. There are many leaders in this country who are admired because of how they dress, the car he drives, the helicopter he flies in. What mm. has he actually done? You find the admirers can't really tell you. Mm. Yeah, they can't really tell you what he has done, but he's, 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 he's great because he flies in, in a helicopter. And, that, and, and that's what our young people are sucking in every day it's being shown to them every day you find even some people gain riches from trading with government tell the young people that you must save you must invest yeah and, like, all that. and and young people no they didn't get there by investing or saving they got there through their connections to to state largesse and and uh, i think this is it's a very sad thing because it's everywhere even i remember when the late wangari Mathai won the nobel prize mm. a great global honor the headline on the nation was that Wangari Mathai wins a hundred and ten million shilling prize. They did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they did not say about. No, no. The Nobel was what? in the writing. The details. Yeah, hundred and wins a hundred and ten million dollars because it, it was it was it's, I think a million dollars some, something of the prize where you're giving. Yeah. Mm. But Wangari Mathai wins a hundred and ten million dollars. And 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 we it's a it's a grave grave illness that we all have and even even you see our media they they uh -huh. they parrot government because because they want government advertising which is shillings or dollars. That's why they can't uh, they they can't speak up because they want government ad they want state advertising. So sometimes it, it, I even wonder whether they are aware of how much decadence because it's decadence. How much yeah. decadence they spew into the public and whether they're yes. proud of it. And you know, actually speaking of work, 
you know, people have the in the US, you have Walter Conkright, Christian yeah, Alpha, yeah, who, yeah, I don't yeah. know who are our veteran journalists. What happens to yes. them? Yeah. They they yeah, don't yeah. get to report better and better stories and do bigger, bigger stories. They end up in PR after yes, a while, yes. or they go away. They have to go or, away. Or government spokespersons. Oh yeah. I either at county or national government. There's that, no that, group that... of work. You know, you yes. start a job and there's a limit. After that, yes. you're told administration or join politics. Yeah, there, there's but a you ceiling. don't become better at that work. No, no, you don't become better. You don't become better at that work, and you don't become any more respected. And and I think this, this is this is the continuous violence that as mm -hmm. I think some of these organizations, even as people grow more senior, you get anxious because I'm getting to the point when I'm where I'm going to either be kicked out or or handcuffed to certain writings that I can that I cannot say this, I cannot say this. Mm. I'm going to either choose between handcuffs or the exit. So in fact, juniors have relatively more freedom because they have a longer career about uh, before them. And it's almost like the way the way our even our, our military forces, etc. Uh, function. When you get senior, you get anxious. Am I about, will I reach the top or will I be kicked out put into a parastatal or Nairobi, Nairobi metropolitan, metropolitan. Yeah. or Kenya Meat Commission or some embassy, you know. Meanwhile, people walk in and out of the border shooting people and throwing bombs, but no. Yeah, yes, our, yes. Our military experts are doing administration and butcheries. And they, are, they are running butcheries. And, and the, the, <laughs> the, the, the relatively lucky ones end up in diplomatic etc. So, so you, you end up in after spending 40 years in a career, now you are sitting somewhere signing leave forms or doing attending impressed. cocktail parties or whatever. You are impressed, yeah. After, after, after. So you are now in service. What you are doing is not work because the 40 years that you spent building your expertise has been deleted with the button, like on a computer. <sighs> Select and cut. Control X. So what is work then? Work is work, work is power. Mm. Work is power. It's 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 something you perform based on on your skills, your knowledge, and your aptitude. And it's power. It's something that that ideally someone should not take away from you. Mm -hmm. Work is a work is a is is a good farmer producing good food to enhance our food security. A good doctor doing good surgery or whatever it is to return a uh, injured accident victim back to back to health i sort of imagine that orthopedic surgeons maybe someone had an accident broke so many bones i should imagine every time meets that guy walking down the street that is power to that's power to him but mm. but uh, yeah so when you move him when you move him into maybe a ministry of health position he's now md of kemsa his power is gone he has a salary, he has office, but zero power. A minister who knows nothing about medicine can call him and tell him, you stupid man, I want you to do ABC. And he'll say, yes, sir. So basically, we need the, to fight for the right to work. Not even yes. for the right for jobs, yes. but no. the right to work, to yes. get dignity from that work, but also yes. uh, to sustain our lives. It's not yes. just about a salary and housing and what. It's also about something that we can feel. Looking back, we say, this is what I did. And then yes. even our um, children can be proud of us. They can say, you see that building? It's my father who designed it. Yes. Yes. And I, and I think, I think the, 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 the fight, you're right. It's a fight. And, and I'm sorry, if anyone who does is not ready to fight, mm. you are in trouble. You, you'll, be, you'll get trampled on. So first thing we have to recognize that there's a whole system out there that does not want us to do that. Oh, yes. That, yes. Mm. That is why an international organization will spend millions of dollars to build a lodge in a livestock producing area, but will not spend a penny to make a slaughterhouse or a cattle dip. Oh, yeah. Not a penny. 
not a penny. Because they don't want you to work, they want you to serve. If they built a slaughterhouse, you would be disposing your livestock, you'd be making money, they wouldn't need to give you handouts, and you'd be taking your, they don't need to even build a school there, you can afford to take your kid to school any place you want. And the community can generate enough money to build a school. Yes, oh, and, and as I've always asked, in, I work in a lot of these pastoralist areas, I know countless people who have become fabulously wealthy from livestock. I do not know a single one who has become wealthy from bid work. Being a waiter. <laughs> or being a waiter. Yeah, being a waiter, bid work, being, be, mm. be, yeah. And those kind of things. Those things are service. Those are not jobs. They do not create, they, those are not livelihoods. They do not create wealth or stability or dignity. But they are the ones that keep being touted as jobs. And that's why you always find the people who facilitate those kind of um uh, servitude are those who are consistently recipients of these international conservation awards. I recently asked a question, why are so many Kenyans received these international awards, but not one of them is a KWS ranger, the ones who actually put their lives on the line to protect wildlife. They're mm. never given, the, because, because that is work, it's not servitude. The system does not award, award work. It's award servitude. And you and know... That, that's the problem uh, we face. And that was one of the reasons why me, I decided I'm not wasting my brains writing proposals for funding. Yeah. Because yes. you waste so much of your energy. And these people ask for such detailed answers mm -hmm. to the questions. Mm -hmm. You're not sure yes. that you will get that money. And after wasting all that time, you don't get the grant. I just said, I'm yes. not wasting my time on this anymore. They are taking <laughs> my work. They are taking my, my energy. They are taking my Your thinking. Life. My life. I'm spending time writing a grant. I won't get it. And yeah. who knows what they do with those proposals? Who knows? Yes. Yes, I, I, I've once written a, pro, a, a proposal for, for work, wetlands to work, and they even asked me for the type of life jackets we will have in the canoe we'll be using. At that point, I don't even know if I'm getting the funding. Can you imagine going scouting, looking for brands of life jackets to, so you can write in a proposal? And you have not been paid. You're not being no, paid no, no, for no. this. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is just you are suffering. <laughs> Did you get it? No, no. <laughs> no, we no. decided I'm not doing that. <laughs> and you know, after even after that conversation, we the first one where you are saying the the greatest amount of freedom is when you say, I don't care if you publish me. Yeah, Imagine yeah. I wrote two articles, we are in 2021. I yeah. sent them in 2019, not even yes. last year. 2019, end of 2019. Mm -hmm. They have never got back to me. Not yeah. even to say we have rejected yeah. your, your, your article. So, but now because I, of what you said, I said, you know what? I'll, yeah. I'll find a way to publish them anyway. Yeah, it's over yeah. two years later. If a kid born then is now starting to talk. That, that's work time. That's valuable time that you will mm. never recover again. And someone's just taking it and sort of throwing it down the tubes carelessly like that. So I, I think the, the whole system is very abusive. And yes. there's a doctor, there's a, there's a doctor who's, who's, uh, who, who's very close to me, actually it's a relative. Mm. And they did this amazing surgical orthopedic procedure. And he was wondering where, where and how he can get it published. And, you know, they have all the evidence, the, the guy getting up and walking and all this kind of thing. And I told him, make a YouTube video interviewing the guy and show him walking and put that online. There is no empirical evidence that's better than that man walking up and down the street. And put it online and just disrupt that. Because once you want to publish, someone wants to be a co-author, someone who never participated in the surgery. Oh, yeah. Someone wants to be a, yeah. Someone wa you'll have three, four co-authors who had nothing to do with what you did. And, don't <laughs> and, and, and once it's published, they will be credited with that thing. It will not be you, the people who actually did it they will be credited with this new breakthrough. And you'll see it on CNN or BBC or whatever, and you'll be, 
you'll you'll be shown there like like you are one of the people holding the clipboard on the side there. And you take ownership, put it out there. So when anyone if, ever publishes this in the future, someone say, "Oh no, I saw this thing on YouTube." Actually, it was on YouTube five years ago, so it's not new. But yeah, but then you'll have hijacked ownership of it. And in fact, I, Africans, we have to resort to that because if we yes. start trying to get published and recognized and grants and I don't know what, our work mm. just disappears. It yes, just like, disappears. Like, like, like the, man, the manuscript you submitted. Maybe the reason you haven't heard back is because it's been transformed into a proposal. And you'll see some, <laughs> one of these days, you'll see a project with vaguely familiar ideas and say, hey, that sounds like what I wrote mm. in the paper in 2019. If it if it's bad, it gets rejected. If it's good, it gets hijacked. Either way, it's lose lose for you. And and you were talking about how this system works with the farming because it's, this is not even just about professionals mm. like no, doctors no, no, no. and no. teachers, but even mm. farmers and people who work yes. with their hands. Yes, farming farming it's it, the system really needs farming to be transformed to work from work into servitude mm. that's why all our policies all our policies work to suppress farming that produces things for us things that we can use for example as like maize these vegetables etc all these sectors people are suffering the ones that are thriving and have government support including tax breaks etc are flowers mm. um, cash crops cash crops like like tea Tea, you know, is, is you as a tea farmer, you have absolutely no use for tea other than to sell it to the tea factory. You can't, mm -hmm. ferment, you can't do anything with it. Um, uh, flowers, canola, tea, uh, some of these vegetables for, for export, etc. Because those are servitude. It's farming done in service of someone else. And even as I said, my neighbor, my neighbor here, there's a World Bank project that uh, is seeking to recruit farmers who are currently producing maize into producing popcorn that uh, variety of maize for popcorn and so oh, this, is a deliberate, popcorn. Yeah, this is a deliberate move to get them away from producing something they actually use into producing something that is meant for someone else and this 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 is servitude and you re even re remember the recent milk bill that sought to outlaw mm. local sales of of milk there was even a part, there's even a farm bill that sought to outlaw the use of farmyard manure in, 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 uh, in farms. And this was not more than two years ago. I remember thinking like, is someone going to come outlaw. into my gate? Outlaw. Yes, use the use of farmyard manure. I even remember wondering if someone is going to come into my gate and inspect my sheep pen to, see, to make sure I haven't taken any manure from there into my kitchen garden. And this is because we need servitude. We, servitude is buying artificial fertilizer, um, producing yeah. crops for someone else. And yeah. the system wants servitude. It doesn't want work. It doesn't want you to produce for yourself. It doesn't want you to empower yourself and be self-sufficient. By definition, agriculture, commercial agriculture should grow out of self-sufficiency. But actually, we have commercial agriculture that has nothing to do with self-sufficiency. We have enslaved, indentured farmers working hard to produce for someone else. Flowers. Flowers yes. which cannot even be eaten. They'll be taken, yes. someone will do this and then throw yes. after two days. And yet flowers were even more special than people. When no flights were going between Kenya and the UK for, to take people, there was a flight taking flowers to be sniffed by some people out there. People who even them, by the way, the UK has, is just as messed up as here. Even the UK, the, the NHS workers, they are like, they're not yes. being supported, but somehow, as we are sending a thank you to NHS workers with flowers. Yes, yes, yes. It's some <laughs> flowers that are trimmed and attended by people who don't even know what the NHS is. I, I even, even a further field, I saw a shocking documentary that um, cacao farmers in West Africa, they have no idea what this thing is used for. Someone what? was introducing chocolate to them and they, they are just, what is this? Like, yeah, they have no idea what it is. They farm it, they harvest it and hand they, it they over. They sell. Yeah. 
Yeah, they hand it over. And th- this is the servitude. This is the servitude that, that's gotten into, into, into agriculture. And that, that's why the certain crops, the resilient food crops are never promoted. Um, the traditional maize that, that you can grow from, from your harvest, you can replant again, that is actively being suppressed because we want you to buy seeds, we want you to buy fertilizer and this kind of thing. So servitude, we seek servitude everywhere. And, and I think, I think th- this is what we must break free from as, as, as a country whether we are talking about farmers, health workers, scientists, or technicians and all this kind of thing. Haven't you seen houses designed with very, in fact, here around Nanyuki where I live, there are a lot of new housing that are designed with very steep roofs, the kind of roofs they use in Switzerland so snow can slide off. Quite snows in Nanyuki or what? Meanwhile, the truth is here, that roof is so steep that you can't have a strain water. It just splashes out of the, the gutter because of the speed it builds going down the steep slope. But they picked that from a Swiss or European architectural manual and they think it looks nice. Yet and they didn't they... bother to ask our, no. our local architects, can you design yeah. a, a, yeah. an eco-friendly Kenyan house? In, in fact, probably it's our local architects who, who distinguish themselves by being able to de- build a Swiss house in Nanyuki. <laughs> There's so much wastage of knowledge and brain power and expertise in this country. And, and you know, the, yeah, the, big, the the funniest thing about that is I actually know a Swiss architect who lives here and her yeah. house is not like that. <laughs> yeah, because we yeah. don't have snow. It no, makes, we don't need it the, makes yeah. sense for them to want the snow to slide quickly. But water sliding yes, quickly. Yes, yes. It's it splashes out of the gutter. You don't harvest. Aki. But this is the natural. This is the natural thing we do. Mm. And and for such wastage to happen in this country, we have an overarching system. And I want yes. us to connect that to whiteness and colonialism and aristocracy. 